Hi, my name is Brandon Billings and I am presenting The Art of Collaboration, Adam State, Hollywood, and The Twilight Zone. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk to you about how, through a collaborative effort, we brought the hit popular television show into live theater. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk about collaboration and how that plays a significant role in theater. I'm going to talk you, to you about the history of The Twilight Zone, and I'm going to tell you the story of our Twilight Zone and how that came to be. So to begin, let's talk about collaboration in theater. Well, theater is a collaborative art form. At its essence, theater is the art of collaboration, working together to produce works of art that entertain, educate, and inspire audiences to view the world in a new way. It is also an exploration of the human condition and how people cope with the fear of the unknown. So that's just a little info about what theater can do. But why the Twilight Zone? Well, let's start with a little history lesson of the Twilight Zone. The Twilight Zone ran for five seasons on CBS Studios from 1959 to 1964. And in that time, through the lens of fantasy and science fiction, it covered such topics as racism, war, addiction, extremism, violence, ageism, and consumerism. All because of its creator, Rod Serling. Now, Rod Serling was born in 1925 in Sierra Cruz, New York, and later in his life would go on to serve in World War II. Rod Serling was assigned to the 511th Parachute Infantry Regiment of the 11th Airborne, where he saw major combat. Now this combat is what is going to reflect his writing. When he came home, he suffered from nightmares, insomnia, and flashbacks. But this didn't stop him from writing. In 25 years, Serling had 250 teleplays and screenplays produced, while also winning six Emmys. So why did he write his Twilight Zone? Well, the Twilight Zone, for me, I see it as a warning a series of warnings about humans and society and what we need to do better. So why did I tackle something like this? Well, here's where it started. In my junior year at Adam State Theater, we were required to submit proposals for our senior thesis. Now, in other words, this could be our senior capstone project. So it's a culmination of four years of what we have learned and experienced. This can include directing, acting, writing, or designing, right? So I wanted to direct, but I didn't know what I wanted to direct. But I knew that at the time there was the Me Too movement. There was the struggle of having your voice heard, your individual truths understood. So I wanted to really do something like that. Through a simple conversation with a friend, we talked about monsters and how they scared us as a child. So we talked about Dracula, Frankenstein, the mummy, the list goes on. The discussion then led to talking about the gremlin from Nightmare at 20,000 Feet, a very famous Twilight Zone episode. And that got me to thinking. So I searched and I searched for a script that we could do, and we couldn't find anything. I found one script in California that I could have done, but a major television network wasn't going to allow it. But I was informed from them that I can write my own adaptation of the series. So I got to work. And I watched all 156 of the original Twilight Zone episodes. In this journal, I took notes on every single episode and what the message was of that episode. I also had to think through the lens of a director, right? So I had to think about what is the character breakdown? What is the gender breakdown? What is the connection of the characters and the story? Again, what is the message? And also, are we able to do this on stage theatrically? So all these different things I had to think about, right? So after some time of writing and working, I finally finished the script. I finished the adaptation. So now it was time to get to work and bring together a team, a collaborative team. So I began sp speaking with Assistant Professor David Gerke and Professor Dana Province, of the co-chair of Art and Theater, to talk about prosthetics, masks. 
So the three episodes that we did were Time Enough at Last, a story about a man who all he wants to do is read. He is oppressed from doing so, and because of a nuclear holocaust, he is the last man on Earth. He finally gets his wish to read until his glasses break. The second episode we did was Nightmare at 20,000 Feet. This is an episode about a man who was just released from a mental hospital due to a nervous breakdown. He is on an airplane flying home with his wife when he notices a gremlin on the wing of the plane destroying it, and he's the only one that can see it. The third episode was Eye of the Beholder, a story about Miss Janet Tyler wanting to be nothing but beautiful, to conform to this society. So why do we want to make masks? In Eye of the Beholder, the twist is, is Janet Tyler in our eyes is beautiful, but in the society that she is in, she is everything but. Everyone in that society has pig-like faces, just like this. So this was made from scratch through collaboration of the art and theater department through Dana Province's class and David Gerke's class, two separate classes coming together using their unique skills to create these prosthetics. So now I'm going to share with you a little video of the beginning steps of this mask making process and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about what this what other elements were included. So enjoy. So that video you just watched was actually step two of the process, the making of the mold. Now this was the making of the mold, and this was done by a Professor Dana Provitz's mold design and cold casting class 
and Assistant Professor David Gerke stage makeup. So when we were talking about which masks we wanted specifically, we did a lot of visual research, right? So we looked at the images, we watched the episodes, and figured out how are we going to do this? What is the best and safest way to do this? So after the classes came together to make the molds, they used clay to sculpt the pig face appliance, right? So in other words, the prosthetic of each face mold. And after this was done, they made a mold of the face, you know. Um, they removed the clay from each actor's face, and then using a product called Dragon Skin Silicone, they created the appliance or prosthetic pig masks by putting the two masks together. So after this process was done, it was now time to clean and trim and apply the masks to the faces using a skin safe silicone adhesive. Now, my poor actors, they had to get in these masks almost every single night. And I can tell you that they probably did not enjoy that very much, but for art, right? So that was just a little bit of what we did. That's just a little piece of collaboration. So now I want to talk to you about each episode individually and how we brought television to theater. So be to begin, let's talk about the character of Rod Serling, because this is going to play a huge role in the story. So in the original Twilight Zone, Rod Serling was the host. He was the guide for the audience, right? He came on as the opening monologue and the closing summary of what we just saw. So I wanted our Rod Serling to be more than that. And in this image I'm going to share with you in a second, you could see Dr. John Taylor, who played our version of Rod Serling, sitting in a red chair, watching what he created. And in this story, he can alter, he can help the characters, he can talk and interact with the audience. Some people ask me, is our Rod Serling against or with the characters? And that's for you to decide, was he with them or was he against them? Or was he just helping to tell the story? So here's the image. Also, Rod Serling also aided in creating the atmosphere. So now I'm going to go through each episode one by one and share with you video clips of what we did differently and how we did it theatrically using set, costumes, lights and sound, hair and makeup. Here's the first video of Time Enough at Last. Enjoy. So in that video, you got to see Rod Serling affecting the set, changing it into this post-apocalyptic setting. But what else helped shape that post-apocalyptic setting? Well, light and sound and acting. So you heard sound-wise, you heard the boom, the nuclear explosion. You saw the lights going off like crazy. And the acting from Joaquin Rodriguez made it believable that this was a nuclear holocaust. And also, using these, pr these practical elements, we are able to help the audience use their imagination to make it actually feel like they are in this wasteland. So now, I'm going to talk about Nightmare at 20,000 Feet. Now, of course, we couldn't bring a Boeing 757 in our experimental theater. That's out of our budget. So how did we bring that to the theater? How did we make it believable that this was an airplane? Well, once again, set acting, lights and sound, costumes, aiding in that imagination. Enjoy. My husband wants to see the flight engineer. All right, if you stay right here, I'll have him right with you. Thank you, it's very important.
It's out there! What's going on? Pull your broken counter plates! It? So what did we see in that video clip? Well, we saw the gremlin coming up from the platform. And in theater, sometimes we use platforms to show status. But in this case, we used it as an airplane wing, right? And also where the actor sat. That's their seat to the plane. You might have also noticed them walking in an aisle of light. Now, what was that? Well, that's the aisle of the airplane. And you also heard sound-wise. You heard the rumble of thunder and the sound of lightning, right? The, the lighting effect, right? And you saw that the actors were only moving in that aisle of light to make it more believable that this was an airplane. And also the help of the sound of the airplane. I even had people come up to me and tell me that they actually felt like that they were on an airplane. So this next clip I'm going to show you is from Eye of the Beholder. Now this whole episode is about not seeing faces, not seeing these pig-like faces, right? So that was the big thing is how can we, how can we do this without showing these faces? Well, I watched the episode hundreds of times and I finally came to the idea of using silhouette and shadow. And with collaboration, I was able to work with my lighting designer and how we can do that. One thing to note, as you notice, in the Nightmare and 20,000 Feet clip and the Time Enough at Last clip, you saw that frame, right? Well, that frame is a, an expressionistic set piece of a television. So using this television, we put a white curtain in front of the actors, the doctors, the nurse, and the nurse too. And behind the actors was a lighting instrument that cast their silhouettes in shadows until the big reveal. So enjoy this clip. Congregated. <laughs> no, no, you mean segregated. You mean imprisoned, don't you, doctor? You are talking about a ghetto, aren't you? A ghetto designed for freaks! Miss Tyler! Now, state is not unsympathetic. I understand, but I must confess, it's easier for me to think of her as human when her face is covered up. But why, nurse? Why must we feel that way? What is the dimensional difference between beauty and something repellent? Is it skin deep? <laughs> no, less than that. Why, nurse, why? Why should people be allowed to be different? Why? Doctor, be careful. What you're speaking is I know, treason. Since I just showed you some of the differences we made from television to theater, I want to talk about why I chose these three specific episodes to adapt and direct. Well, they each shared a common theme, a message, a warning to society. Now, real quick, I want to share with you this right here. This is going to be... This is the final monologue that Rod Serling spoke to the audience. This is a compilation of famous Rod Serling quotes and ideas. You went on a journey with Mr. Henry Bemis, Mr. Robert Wilson, and of course, Miss Janet Tyler, all of which experienced something darker than any probable fallout or hegemonic society. They experienced the harsh concepts created by the monsters that we come face to face with every day. Society, loneliness, isolation, and oppression. These are not restricted to the vast imaginative creations of those monsters. For civilization to survive, the human race has to remain civilized. What if everything you know was immediately stripped away from you? What if everything is beyond your control? You are forced to enter not a dimension, but a new life. To take the first initial step into becoming who you are is not a challenge, but a new beginning, a new light, a new reality. All of these probable concepts are never confined to the Twilight Zone. And why aren't these confined to the Twilight Zone? Many people today consider the Twilight Zone more relatable than it has ever been before. We are still experiencing events from our society. We are, still, we are currently experiencing this isolation. Every day somebody experiences oppression. We still deal with some sort of hegemonic society, right? So this, these are some of the topics that I want to talk about. Now I want to talk about my production concept. Now a production concept for a director is the director's vision of how they want their production to be. And this was mine. To bring audiences old and young for an evening of nostalgia. And by doing this, by making the Twilight Zone theatrical. 
while also asking the audience the complex question of what can we do better in our society. So today I talk to you about how we turned a television show into a theater play. I talk to you about collaboration in theater, the history of the Twilight Zone and what it talks about. I talk to you about the story of our Twilight Zone and how dedication, collaboration of two departments came together to create a work of art. So I thank you for your time and I hope you enjoyed this. And I encourage you to sign on to your Netflix, CBS, or Hulu accounts and watch the Twilight Zone and see these different warnings. Thank you.